those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Just on this question, but the hypermutation would have a big effect on, let's say your mitochondrial DNA, your Y chromosome, because those are uni parentally inherited DNA, as we would agree. The mitochondrial DNA, we, we inherit almost exclusively from our mothers. Y chromosome from our fathers. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. The biparentally inherited DNA, though, as we were talking about earlier, which is the nuclear DNA, recombined, for example, created heterozygosity would now apply. As, I, as me and Walker were talking about earlier, Neanderthals would have had millions of created differences. What this means is the corresponding increase due to the hypermutation would be virtually undetectable in the nuclear DNA because, because of the uh, incredible amount of inbreeding. But by far, Speed, the greatest impact would be, as I said, due to the levels of inbreeding. That means it's entirely plausible to have biparentally inherited DNA be less diverse, which we agreed with. We spent most of the, the debate on that, but we agreed with it. And yet the less diverse than modern humans, we should say, say, let's be correct. But the uniparentally inherited DNA to be more diverse, which is the mitochondrial DNA, which is where we need the hypermutation to have the most significant impact because that's where the DNA differences are that cannot be attributed to created heterozygosity and that are corresponding to the most recent common ancestor of modern uh, people groups. So what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, okay, so you said that they would have been front loaded with uh, allelic diversity and stuff like that. In the but we, DNA, yeah. yeah, in the nuclear DNA. But we still have DNA samples from Homo sapiens from that time period, right? And we still don't see them as an in group. Um, right, and that's a problem. Yeah. And, and another thing is. Yeah, but you're looking at so, created heterozygosity. So you're looking at nuclear DNA markers because cause now we're talking about the mitochondrial. So are you saying the mitochondrial DNA? Because I want to know why you believe that the hypermutation is inconsistent. I, I get what you're saying about the, the phylogeny, the phylogenetics, where they... Yeah, now. well, that was like a separate we, point, but yeah. Yeah, so, so just the hypermutation. Why do you believe that they are inconsistent with each other? Because, as I said, the inbreeding would be your greatest effect in the nuclear DNA. Okay. And the hypermutation would be almost undetectable. But yet the mitochondrial DNA, which is only 16,000 letters long, this is where there would be the most significant impact. And therefore, both can be consistent. Yes, you have hypermutation in the whole genome, of course. Of course, you have hypermutation in the whole genome. But the nuclear DNA, the size of it, the recombination that occurs in it, combined with our position of created heterozygosity, those mutations would be virtually undetectable, but not undetectable in the mitochondrial DNA. So that's how they both can... Dr. Dan says they're, they, they have to be mutually exclusive, when in fact that's not the case. And I'm glad that we ended up agreeing that the inbreeding is um, is observed. But yeah. now we have to go into the mitochondrial DNA. That's where the hypermutation is going to have the most significant impact.